So thank you all for coming today. Um, today is, I guess, the, about the halfway point through the lunchtime talks in science and math this semester. In a couple of weeks, we have Dr. Beaton from chemistry, who will be giving a presentation on a topic I've forgotten. Los Alamos. Oh, yes, Los, Los Alamos and the Manhattan Project uh, history. And then toward the end of the semester, in early January, Dr. Benson will be giving a talk on plate tectonics or something of that sort. The dangers of subduction. Dangers of subduction. <laughs> <laughs> they have much better titles. So, today uh, we're all fortunate here to uh, have Dr. Aldrich, who's going to be speaking on linear systems of equations. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, when I was in graduate school at the University of Kentucky, go cats, uh, <clears throat> I took a class on, it was, the title of the class was French for Scientific Reading Knowledge. And it was a required class for graduate students in the sciences. Uh, and like most people, I suppose, I got homesick one time and called a few of my friends back in Colorado. And I was talking to one of them who didn't go to college. And I was explaining to him what classes I was in. And I said, that title. And he said, really? What are you taking that class for? I thought you were going to school for math. And I said, yeah, actually, I am going to school for math. And all of us have to take this class. And he said, why? And I said, well, a lot of science and math is written in French. Uh, now, not everybody had to take French. You could take French, German, or Russian. Those were your three choices. Uh, but he said, really? So um, if you get a paper in French, then you'd have to translate it or something? And I said, yeah. And he, he took a few minutes, and then he said, whoa. I said, what? He said, I was thinking, when you were telling me that story, that there were people that should be doing that, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, but that's going to be you. And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, OK. <laughs> so uh, the theme for today's lecture is going to be, there are people who do that. <laughs> Uh, that being said, I've worked at Adams State, this is my seventh year now, and I've been coming to the lunchtime talks pretty faithfully. I don't know that I've missed one, and I would like to thank Dr. Nairing for his hard work in organizing these. Yeah, I was there for that. I know you were. <laughs> All right, to it. Uh, <clears throat> first example is a very classic example of a linear system. Uh, we have two temperature scales. One of them is Fahrenheit. The other one is Celsius. The interesting thing for us about Fahrenheit and Celsius is they are two different ways of measuring the same thing, temperature. Uh, the way we're going to describe this problem is to look at the degrees Fahrenheit for water boiling and freezing, and same thing for Celsius boiling and freezing. So uh, in Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is freezing, 212 degrees Fahrenheit is boiling, this is for water. For Celsius, 0 degrees Celsius is freezing, 100 degrees Celsius is boiling, this should all sound familiar to you. So does this mean that 0 equals 30? No, 0 doesn't equal 30, does it? I mean, that's ridiculous. But 0 and 30 are now related. They are paired because 0 degrees Celsius means uh, freezing temperature for water, and that's the same thing as 30 deg 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So what we do is take those data and put them together in pairs. I'm putting Celsius first. You could put Fahrenheit first. It doesn't really matter. Let's say that this is alphabetical. So I put Celsius first, Fahrenheit second. I put those data together, and then I draw a picture. What you see on the picture here is Celsius going across the bottom and Fahrenheit going up on the vertical axis there. This is the freezing point for water. This is the boiling point for water. And you have this nice scale going between them. And one of the things you can see just from the picture is that as Celsius goes up, Fahrenheit goes up, this should kind of agree with your intuition, right? So we actually teach in a lot of our classes how to find the equation for that line. We teach this in finite math. We teach this in college algebra. We probably teach this in some of the developmental courses. And we definitely use these kinds of ideas in a lot of, our, uh, a lot of areas. Uh, one of the things we do to get that started is to calculate the slope of that line. We take the difference in Fahrenheit, divide by the difference in Celsius, you end up with 9 over 5. That's the reduction of that fraction. What this tells you, though, is that if you raise the temperature 9 degrees in Fahrenheit, then that's going to raise the temperature 5 degrees in the Celsius scale. This is a nice number here for if you need to convert something. It, you have to have a place to start but that'll let you convert up or down. 
It also, it also means that if the Fahrenheit temperature goes down 9 degrees, the Celsius temperature goes down 5 degrees. So <coughs> one of the things I want to do with that is put it into an equation, and we would start maybe in point-slope form. So I have my slope here is the 9 fifths, and then I just put one of the temperature readings in there. This is for the freezing point. After you do that, you do a little bit of algebra. I rewrite the equation. I'm going to put my variables on the left and my constants on the right, and I'm going to do that pretty consistently this noon. And I also want to get rid of the fractions, so I'm going to multiply by 5. What I end up with is an equation, negative 9c plus 5f equals 160. We're going to use a phrase to describe that equation. We're going to say that 160 is a linear combination of C and F. Just a quick example of how to use an equation of this form. Uh, suppose that we know that outside is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That means F is 40 in our formula. We plug that into the equation that we had. There's our 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and then we just solve for Celsius. 40 over 9 is about 4, so over there we could say the temperature outside is about 4 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> for the next couple of slides, I want to focus on that negative 9c plus 5f. Uh, hopefully, this is going to give you a different perspective on an old problem. Negative 9c plus 5f is actually a function that we can use to identify uh, what we're going to call a transformation. So, I'm going to change the letters here, make it a little bit more familiar in terms of an algebra problem. I'm going to change it from x, uh, c and f to x and y. So, t of xy is going to be negative 9x plus 5y. And I just want to note that t is a function that's taking pairs of data, x's and y's, and is giving you an output that's just a number. So I have a picture here to represent that. You're taking a pair from the Cartesian plane. Is there a question? Oh. By the way, if you do have a question, let me know. Anyway, so it's taking pairs of numbers and giving you one number out of this formula. Uh, the number 160 on the axis would be way over here. The number 160 is peculiar to the Fahrenheit and Celsius scales, but if you wanted to change it to Kelvin, the negative 9c plus 5f would still be negative 9k plus 5f. You would just have to change the 160 to something else, because Celsius and Kelvin use the same scale. They just start in a different place. So that function, negative 9x plus 5y, has some important properties. One of them is that if you take the point 0, 0, which is x equals 0, y equals 0, and put it into that function, you get the number 0. We're going to be looking for that. Another property, this is a little bit messy, but uh, you'll forgive me, I hope. If I take two pairs, x1, y1, and x2, y2, <coughs> add them together, and then push them through the function, which you see here as I'm adding the points inside t. Over here is the right-hand side. Uh, this is negative 9x plus 5y. I just have special x's and y's in there. I do a little bit of algebra and arithmetic. I rearrange all the terms. What you see is that t of the sum of two points can be actually rewritten as the sum of two t's. So in a sense, you can pull out the t and write it in a uh, different expression. So some of us probably are smiling because this looks familiar. Some of us are probably frowning because we're allergic to algebra. <laughs> There's another property with similar derivation. I'm not going to go through all the steps, but if I take a constant times a point, uh, and then push that through the transformation, I can actually pull that constant out in front of the transformation as well. This is called scalar multiplication. Now, take all of that information, put it together, we, call, we have one phrase for all of that information. We just say that T is a linear transformation. Hold on to that. <clears throat> there was a book called the Quicheng Suang Shu. It's effectively the Chinese version of Euclid's Elements. Uh, there, we have an author that we associate with the Quicheng Suang Shu, but uh, it's more likely to be a compilation of what was known at the time. Uh, in the Quicheng Suang Shu, there's the translation would be arithmetic in nine sections. The eighth section is a collection of problems. The first problem in the eighth section reads as follows. I'll let you read that, and I'll drink some water. You know why I didn't want to read that. That's a mouthful, right? <coughs> <coughs> One of the interesting things for us this noon about this exercise is that it's coming from about 2,000 years ago. Now, the Kui Cheng Shu doesn't just say, here's a problem, let's 
try to find a solution, it actually tells you how to solve the problem. It goes through step by step a solution to what you read inside the, the, print, uh, the quotation marks there. So to do this visually, what you, take, you take the information they gave you in the problem, organize the data. What I did here is put the good crop data in the first column, mediocre crop, bad crop, and then the total price on the right-hand sides. Since we don't know the prices of these crops, we're going to give them names, say X, Y, and Z. I know, I'm creative, right? <laughs> so let's just say X is the price for good, Y is medium, Z is bad, and we get a system of equations. So the book actually tells you how to solve the system. Um, there are lots of ways to do this. Hopefully some of you have had classes where you needed to solve systems of equations so this won't look completely alien to you. The first step for me would be to change that 3 to a 1. You could divide by 3, but you'd have fractions. I'm going to go ahead and switch the rows around a little bit. Make the bottom row the first row. Now you see that there's a 1 up there in the top left corner. After that, I'm going to use that 1 to kill the elements below it. So what I would do there is take this row and subtract three of those, and I won't have an x anymore. If I take this row, whoop, what's happening here? Oh, that's what's happening. If I take that row and subtract two of those, that'll kill that two, and I just code that with a little notation here. That's row two minus three, row one is row two, et cetera. So I perform that operation. I get a couple of zeros here. You see why this is nice, because down here in the bottom right-hand corner, I now have a system of equations that has two variables and two equations, which is easier to solve. I'm not going to show you all the steps. It's not worth your time this afternoon to see that, but you can imagine just performing these until you get to the end, where we have one x in the first row, one y in the second row, one z in the third row. Everything else is canceled, and now the problem has been solved. We have x, y, and z are isolated in each of those equations. And of course, what we want to do then is translate that back to the problem, and we'll just say that one sheaf of the good crop is going to cost you 9.25 due, et cetera. So that process <coughs> is part of the focus of what we're talking about this afternoon. Uh, but we also want to talk about that linear transformation structure. So what you can do for that system that we just saw is take the left-hand sides, right? I had all the variables on the left and I had all the coefficients, uh, sorry, all the constants on the right. So take those formulas, put them into a matrix, and then pull out the coefficients. What you have here is a new function. This function is also going to be called t. It's going to take triples, x, y, z, and it's going to give you triples. This is one number, this is one number, and this is one number. So this is actually a function taking three numbers at a time and giving you back three numbers at a time. This function has the exact same properties as the last one. If you put 0, 0, 0 in, you get 0, 0, 0. If you take two vectors, add them together, and then push it through the transformation, you can actually factor that as two values in the transformation. And the last one there, I have a scalar k. I can pull the scalar out in front. I'm using vector notation there simply because these are three-dimensional vectors that should be pretty standard. So those three properties are actually what categorizes these functions as linear transformations. Every linear transformation has to satisfy those and vice versa. Anything that satisfies those three things is going to be called a linear transformation. So, on New Year's Day in 1801, an Italian astronomer named Giuseppe Piazzi was studying the heavens, and he was looking for something very specific. It had been predicted at that time that there was supposed to be a planet in between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. So he's looking in between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter somehow, for a planet that had yet, been, yet to be discovered. And on New Year's Day in 1801, he sees it. And it's called Ceres. And today it's not a planet, it's called an asteroid. It's actually the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. <clears throat> so on New Year's Day, he sees this thing, and then he proceeds to write down observations on Ceres for the next few weeks. Uh, I think it lasted about four or five weeks that he was able to visualize and, and write down all of his observations on this asteroid, and then it disappeared because he couldn't see it. It got obscured in the rays of the sun. Oops, I went too far. So, <clears throat> he has these observations and he lost the asteroid. He sends the observations that he had recorded to uh, a couple of other astronomers in Europe at the time and said, hey, can you find this because I can't find it anymore. Uh, by 
June of 1801. His observations were published in a journal, and by July of 1801, they had quite a few people that were looking for it again. In August, the observations were published in detail, and by September, you would hope that somebody would have found it, but nobody had found it yet. Uh, another mathematician by the name of Burkhart had actually predicted where Ceres would be using uh, pretty sophisticated mathematical techniques at the time. He predicted where Ceres would be, and they couldn't find it where he said it was supposed to be. So <coughs> by September, people are really pulling their hair out trying to find this asteroid. And uh, in September, uh, a young mathematician by the name of Carl Gauss gets the data and says, I think I know what to do with this. He does a lot of work over the next couple of months, and then he tells the astronomers, it should be here, and on the 31st of December, which is almost exactly one year later, they find it again. It was found by two astronomers um, on the same day. Olbers is the one that's credited with recovering Ceres. What's interesting for us is the system of equations that he had to solve. So I'm just curious, has anybody in this room had to solve a system of equations? Oh, great. Has anybody had to do it by hand? Oh, good. What was the largest system of equations you ever had to solve by hand? I'm just curious. I hear four. Anybody have a bigger? Four? We have a six. Anybody else have any, any systems bigger than six? I know you're curious about me. My biggest system was eight, and that took me the better part of a couple of days to do by hand. Matter of fact, I'll tell you a quick story. It took pages and pages to do an eight by eight system of equations by hand. I made one mistake and I found it. And this is for a homework assignment in graduate school. I turned in my solution and then I turned in my scratch work. The professor did not grade my solution. He graded the scratch work where I made the mistake and took off 10%. Anyway. I know, it's crazy. So, <clears throat> to solve this problem, Gauss actually invented what he considered, well, we consider them two inventions or discoveries. One of the things that he discovered was what we now call Gaussian elimination. Gaussian elimination is a methodical way of solving a system of equations. The funny part about it is he was doing the exact same thing that the Chinese were doing 2,000 years before. So why do we call it Gaussian elimination? Because we're so influenced by the European um, Renaissance. But <clears throat> Another thing that he, saw, that he invented or discovered to solve this problem is the method of least squares. Now, to solve this problem, he had 80 variables, and he had to solve the systems of equations that had up to 17 equations. And he did it in a few months, and he was 24. Change topic a little bit. Any chemists recognize this reaction? Mm -hmm. What is it, Marty? And so over here on the left, this would be benzene. benzene and then oxygen. So benzene and oxygen are combining to give us carbon and water, right? That's what we're looking at, some form. That's what we have on the screen. Okay. <laughs> so we have a benzene reaction. <clears throat> you can imagine, for example, that the benzene is burning and you have something cold that you put on top of it. The soot collects underneath, and what's left over is water. That's what you have there. So we have soot and water coming from benzene and oxygen. I have underlined things there because I don't know what's going into the reaction and I don't know what's coming out in terms of the numbers of molecules in this reaction. So since I don't know what those numbers are, I can give them names. And one of the things about a chemical reaction is you can't have more, um, say for example, you can't have more atoms of carbon going in than you have atoms of carbon coming out. So what you have is the carbon atoms are going to give you a restriction on the variables x1 and x3. The hydrogen atoms are going to give you restrictions on X1 and X4, and the oxygen atoms are going to give you restrictions on X2 and X4 as well. Write that down, you get a system of equations. Move everything over to one side. I have a very similar system of equations. Now, though, I have three equations and four variables. Now, I have some linear algebra students in the room. 
would you expect there to be a solution to that system? Three equations, four variables. You would expect there to be at least one solution, and this system has an obvious solution. If you ignore the chemistry and look at the algebra, there's an obvious solution to this system of equations. What is it? Zero. zero. Right? You can put zero in for all the x's on the left, and you get zero on the right. Great. What does that mean for the chemistry? Nothing happened, right? You didn't put anything in, you didn't get anything out. Well, this system of equations, because it has fewer equations than variables, and you know that it has a solution, it is actually guaranteed to have infinitely many. There are lots of solutions to this system of equations. We can write them down using, I guess, my notation for this. What we have here is a formula telling you that x1 is a function of another variable t, x2 is a function of t, x3 is a function of t, and x4 is a function of t. That t could be any real number as far as the algebra is concerned. Now, if you're running a chemical reaction, you're not allowed to use one-third of an atom of carbon, right? So the convention in chemistry then would be to choose the smallest value of t that gives you all positive numbers in your system, and the smallest value of t there would be 6. I've got to kill those fractions, right? So I just multiply everything by 6. I could choose t to be anything I want, so I choose it to be 6. That's going to give you 2, 3, 12, 6. If you put that back into the reaction here, you see that I have, for example, 12 carbon atoms going in and 12 coming out. I have 6 atoms of oxygen coming in and 6 coming out, and I've balanced the reaction. Does anybody at the Porter talk last week mm -hmm. recognize this guy? Yeah. What is it? Two it's the black rhino, right? The two horn, two horn. Uh, I was actually in a spelling bee when I was in Minnesota, and Diserus was one of our uh, words. And I remember this because it was actually my word. We, we did this scientifically, right? You take the list of words and you just memorize. I memorized this block. You mem we had a team, right? So I memorized this block. You memorized that. That was one of my words. And I looked at this on the slide last week, and I saw the spelling there, and that's not spelled correctly. But then I looked it up, and that's actually the way it's spelled. So the way I learned it was a, uh, an adjective, diserous. But that's a noun. Anyway, what we're looking at here is a black rhino. The black rhino is critically endangered. So one of the things we can do with a linear system is model its population. I have to admit that some of the numbers you're about to see, I made up. Some of them, I didn't. The black rhino, in general, has four life stages. They are infant, immature, sub-adult, and adult. The immature and infant, infant rhinos do not mate, they do not have offspring. The only rhinos that do are the sub-adult and the adult. <coughs> rhinos typically don't have offspring, uh, the female rhinos don't have offspring until they're about five or six years old. Uh, males sometimes take as many as 10 years before they have their first um, child. So you can take the population, uh, the known population of black rhinos, which the latest information I got was from uh, the BBC uh, website. And I took that population and I broke it down into those four stages. So I say that there are 200 infants, 500 immature, 450 sub-adult, and 3690 adults. The adults actually live up to 40 years, so there are going to be quite a few of them when you compare the 40-year-olds to the less than one-year-olds. The other information we would need to model this population is survivorship and offspring. These numbers are numbers that I made up. I tried to find them. I obviously didn't have a whole lot of time. This was just last week, but I tried to find them. I couldn't find survivorship data. I used survivorship data for a different species, and I'm going to just take it and run with it. If we actually knew the survivorship data, we can come back here and redo the problem. But anyway, the other thing is about offspring. Um, again, the offspring are not going to be created until you reach the sub-adult stage, and the adults are going to make more offspring than the sub-adults. So what we do is take this information. Any biology majors in the room? Did you guys ever build a Leslie matrix? Ever heard of a Leslie matrix? Oh. Well, good, you can learn something today. You take all this information and you can build, using some other nonlinear formulas, something called a Leslie matrix. Most of the numbers in the Leslie matrix you see are at least close or related to the ones that are in the data. Basically, what this does is take into account 
the portion of the population that progresses into the next life stage. So these are not the exact numbers in the table that you see down here, but they are coming from those numbers. From the Leslie matrix, I'm going to look at this matrix and think of it as a linear transformation. This linear transformation has four rows and four columns. What that means is that if I have four values and I multiply this matrix times those four values, I'll get four values back. So four go in and four come out. The four going in are the population that we know. The four coming out are next year's population. You multiply this matrix here times this vector here, and you get next year's population. So I did that for 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, etc., and I got this table. First column here is 2011, 4840 was the published population as of like three days ago. These are the breakdown of the population, and then I multiply by the matrix, I get the next year, multiply by the matrix, multiply by the matrix, you go all the way down. To get 20, uh, 2021, you're going to multiply by that matrix 10 times. To get 2041, you're going to multiply by that matrix 30 times. We can use some pretty advanced techniques in terms of linear algebra to describe what's going to happen to this population without actually doing all these calculations. That's a little bit beyond what we want to talk about today, but it is possible. I just want to remind you that I made the matrix up, so it looks pretty bleak for the black rhino over here, but I don't have accurate data. So, that's just an idea of what you can do with those in the biology. So what I've been saying since the beginning of the talk is that every matrix is associated with a linear transformation. If, if the matrix A has n rows and m columns, then the transformation T is going to have inputs that are m-dimensional Euclidean space and outputs that are n-dimensional Euclidean space. So if the rows and columns are given to you in that order, rows and columns, then the inputs and outputs are going to switch those numbers around. So just as an example here, if I have a two-dimensional Euclidean space and a three-dimensional Euclidean space, this is going from two to three, that would be modeled with a three by two matrix. And I'm going to focus on that idea of a transformation. The transformation is taking the points in this space and giving you points in this space. The transformation has to follow the rules. The rules are zero has to go to zero, the sum of two vectors has to go to the sum of two vectors, and a scale of a vector has to go to a scale of a vector. If you follow those rules, then you can build a linear transformation from any matrix that you want. So I picked a couple that I like. One of them is P. P is 0, 1, 1, 0. If you take the matrix P and multiply that matrix, effectively multiply the matrix times the picture, what that matrix is going to do is take the points in this plane, right? This is a two-dimensional space. This is a two-by-two two matrix, so it's going to take points in this space, and it's going to output points in that space. So to figure out what it does, I just take the coordinates of that point, say that's like negative 1, 3, for example. Take the coordinates of that point, multiply it by the matrix, and then I get the coordinates of the output. If you do that for the whole picture, that's what you get. This is why it's called a transformation. It's taking the picture that you have, it's transforming the picture, this one, uh, again, I'm thinking of P as being the action taking from one space to another. Uh, this one would be called a reflection or a flip. So here you see this is the input. The output is on the other side of that black line. So this would be a reflection matrix, so to speak. Kind of cool. Now, if you change the matrix, you get a different transformation. So here's another matrix that I like. <coughs> I'm going to call it R. That matrix Again, it's two by two, so it's going to take a two-dimensional space, give you a two-dimensional space. I start with the same picture on the left. I transform that by multiplying by the matrix, and I get the picture on the right. What that did is it took the parallelogram and rotated it. So that's a rotation matrix. That matrix is coding the transformation. You want it to actually transform something, then you have to multiply. So how do I get PR? Well, PR is the product of the two matrices. So I take the permutation matrix P and the rotation matrix R. I multiply them together. I get a new matrix. That's the matrix. Now, this matrix is two by two. It's going to be a linear transformation. It's coding a linear transformation. To find out what the linear transformation does, I can, oops, what am I doing? I can take the same picture, perform the action, 
and I get a different transformation. Maybe you could call this one a flip-tation, because it flips and rotates at the same time. So that process is something you can see just by playing around with a picture. So here's a nice nurse shark. I saw this nurse shark when I was diving in Costa Rica a few years ago. But you take your picture of the nurse shark and you grab the corner, oops, grab the corner, and you make it smaller, right? Well, that's a dilation. How is this program actually showing you that dilation? It's taking a frame of the picture and multiplying it by a dilation matrix. You can take that same picture and grab the green thing. What does the green thing do? It rotates the picture. Well, that rotation is performed with matrix multiplication. You just take a frame of the picture, and then you find out where the frame goes, and then you kind of fill in the space. <clears throat> and this actually is pretty cool. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but you can take the picture, drag it through the corner, and flip the picture. Kind of turn the shark inside out, so to speak. And I just thought you would see that this is a direct application of what we're talking about here in the program that I'm using to show you the process. Okay, where are we? <clears throat> uh, changing direction again, no pun intended. Suppose I want to do a search, a database search. I want to do a keyword search for linear system internet. Uh, <clears throat> the way that you, one way that you could do this is to take the titles that you have, say for example in Nielsen Library, you write down the keywords in all of their titles. So if I have titles of, for example, database systems and networking would be the title of a book. Using linear systems to search the internet, title of a book. Take all of those titles and find all of their keywords. You make a list of keywords, those keywords are going to form the rows of a matrix. Each one of the titles then is going to be linked with the keywords by saying, for example, the book, first book has database systems networking. So it has database system network. You're going to have a one in the column for that book in each of those entries, and I'll just show you what that looks like. So for the first book, it's database system network. For the second book, it has system network search linear. By the way, I'm interchanging internet and network because the internet is a network. Uh, so the second book had system network search linear, third book had linear algebra application, etc. You do that for all of the books in your library and you get a very large matrix. But when you do a keyword search, going back here, all you're looking for, so the user says, okay, I want linear system and internet. Well, what we do then is code that as a vector that vector is linear system internet. Those are the second, third, and fifth words in my database keywords. I take the database matrix. I actually have to do a little bit of trickeration with the rows and columns. I actually multiply by the transpose for those of you that care. So I take the transpose of the database matrix, multiply by the vector I am searching for, and I get the output here which says you should use book three. That's probably the book you're looking for because it has the most matches with the um, keywords that you were searching. This is a very basic method of searching a database. However, this is how it all started. And when you search on the internet, uh, talk about a search engine, for example, most search engines nowadays are archiving and updating the pages on the internet. So the internet itself has over a trillion pages. And these web crawlers are updating and archiving tens of millions of pages per day. And effectively, this is what's happening behind the scenes. They're taking a matrix, multiplying by a vector, spitting out a vector, and giving you the top 10 things. Now, of course, they change the rules when you start marketing. Some people can pay to have theirs on the top of the list, and the people who pay the most get higher up the list, etc. But this is the kind of foundation. <clears throat> this is what's called a keyword search, and this one is asking for the most times that keyword happens. 
these types of processes have been used long enough that they also have been abused. And so we start changing things and doing things with probability, but this is where it started anyway. So that search is going to ask you to investigate the title using linear systems to search the internet. <coughs> so for the last few minutes here, I'd like to talk about some of the modern uses of linear systems. What you see here is a picture of traffic in Paris, kind of. The traffic that you see is being modeled with a linear system. Basically, to do a linear system on this, you take every intersection of all of the roads that are on the picture. Each of the intersections is going to be a node. And then all of the inputs, hello? So all of the inputs here are going to be traffic coming in, traffic going out. That flow is something that you would model with a matrix. And then you can ask the matrix, uh, sorry, you can ask the matrix for future behavior of the traffic. Does anybody recognize this beast? <laughs> it's a big boat. This is called a drill ship. This is for deep sea ocean drilling. Now, let's say that you're running an oil company and you're looking for oil. Oil companies in general don't own these ships. They rent these ships. And these ships cost them approximately $600,000 a day. So you want to take this ship out into the ocean and you're going to drill for oil. Do you just drive it out to your favorite spot and drill a hole? No, you have to do research, right? You have to have some kind of prediction for where that oil is going to be. Well, to find the oil, what they do is send ships out onto the ocean, and the ships are sending um, information retrieval questions down to the ocean floor. They're looking for formations on the ocean floor. You like that? So they're looking for formations on the ocean floor. Well, how do they do this? Well, they take a big matrix, and they solve a system of equations thousands of times a day. This is actually, uh, well, let me ask you, does anybody know what this is? It is a wiring diagram for a motorcycle. Yeah, it's a wiring diagram for a 2010 Honda. I can't tell you what model because I don't remember. But <clears throat> what you see here is effectively a big circuit. The circuit is governed by Kirchhoff's rules and Ohm's laws and things like that. Well, each one of those is going to give you an equation, and when you're done, you get a system of equations. You solve the system, the system will tell you how much current and charge there is at each stage of the network. Another application that is being used regularly today is what's called a Leontief input-output model. Uh, a lot of words to say you can model an economy with a matrix. The matrix is only as complicated as you want it to be. The more things you want to measure, the more things go into the matrix. What you see here is a matrix that has a couple of aspects or sectors of an economy. For example, agriculture, manufacturing, capital goods, construction, etc. What you do is you take each one of those objects or sectors of the economy and say you need to answer the question effectively. How much agriculture is used to drive agriculture? How much agriculture goes into manufacturing? How much agriculture goes into capital goods? Each one of those ratios then goes into this matrix. You can use this matrix then as a linear transformation to predict what's going to happen in the future iterations of the economy. I tried to find a busy port, and what I found was Hyundai. Hyundai is one of the largest port. Uh, they have one of the largest ports on the planet. And when you're transporting goods, you need to know, how many do I have? Where are they going to go? This is effectively a traffic problem, except for your shipping objects, right? Uh, this is another linear system of equations, a big one, but that's all it is. And then I have, let's see if I can do this.
Oops. So <clears throat> a lot of people like these movies, especially people that have children because they can sit the child in front of the movie and relax for a little while and the children are just enthralled with these things, right? Well, how do you make a movie like that? I mean, there are no actual pictures in that movie. Uh, <clears throat> Pixar is the first company to have a mathematician that was nominated for an Academy Award. And that person actually was taking frames and moving the frames across the screen using linear systems of equations. Thank you all for coming. Is there any questions? Adam State College. Great stories begin here.